Welcome. Hello, Sid Sippers. Welcome back to Retro Recipes. Now, in the last couple of episodes, I've been working with this Macintosh Plus. I gave it a good clean up, removed that Polaroid filter that had caused that kind of ski goggles yellowing around the screen, and tried putting it in a bag full of ozone as a test to see if it would retro bright. When I pulled it out of the bag after three days, unfortunately, there was no sign of de yellowing. But even worse, the ozone had seemingly caused this drive gear to break. Oh my gosh. Uh, and people confirmed to me that ozone gas can degrade plastic, which is what the gear is made of. In better news, in the next episode, I revealed this new light brighting technique and the hypothesis behind it. And we got these startling results after three days of simply putting the machine in the sun. So now the machine looks the part, it's time to fix the part. And here's the machine now. Oh my gosh, it's shrunk in the sun. Oh wait, no, that, sorry. That's the uh, Apple Macintosh from my Seinfeld set replica. Put that back there for Jerry. This is a perfectly to scale replica of the Seinfeld sitcom set from the 80s. And over there you can see Jerry's Apple Macintosh. He actually used a few different Macintoshes through the series, but the most common one is probably the Macintosh SE, which you would have seen in a lot of the earlier episodes. However, when Hulu brought the pop-up location of the Seinfeld set to Los Angeles, they put in place of the Mac what people called some bullshit PC. No Mac for you! So I quickly rushed to the set, but thankfully by then they had put this Macintosh Performer 200 in its place. Not quite an SE, but close enough. Oh, wait, no, you, you weren't meant to see that. Hey, what, how are these? Uh, oh my goodness. Make it. Oh, sorry, sorry. Well, we'll leave the Seinfeld set behind and return to my set. And for this mod, we're going to need a screwdriver, a long screwdriver. No, a very long screwdriver. And on the end, we'll need a Torx T15 tool. And one of these to discharge the CRT, just in case. And of course, uh, you will need to buy a Darth Vader oven mitt. I find your lack of eject disturbing. I am in power here. Oh. Well, I do have the power to steal Puppy Fractic's bed. <laughs> Talk about if it looks good kill. Oh, I think I'm forgiven. And there you can see the Torx screws. So we simply stick this in here, give it a turn, and... Oh, uh, that would just, I'll, oh, oh, it's left the, how do I, uh, but, uh, right, oh, ow, jeez, uh, oh, this is getting ridiculous, maybe I can, uh, nope, uh, still, no, oh, come on. Finally, oh, oops. Ah, <clears throat> so um, cancel that, and I'm going to use this small T15 screwdriver. There's another one here above the battery, which thankfully the previous owner had removed, and two at the base. And then a little bit of force, and we just use the screen's own weight to remove the back case. And things are looking pretty good in here. I'm not noticing any bulging capacitors. Uh, it is recommended to usually replace these, but I'm guessing we're okay. And there's the floppy drive. 
So one thing I like to do is attach this screwdriver to this ground lug and we'll need our oven mitt. I'm actually just joking. Personally, I don't think this is necessary, but you do try this at your own risk. And if you do die, don't come running to me. And one thing I like to do is just make sure I've discharged everything there, including the flyback transformer. And finally, even though we're not working on the CRT, it's just a good habit to get in there and discharge that too. Boop. And now things are safe. We can start to remove that floppy drive. So we'll switch our T15 for a Phillips screwdriver. Make sure we give it back to Philip afterwards. Remove the analog bolt connector from the logic board. And the logic board slides out. And that again looks in pretty good condition. You can see our one megabyte of memory there. So powerful. And out comes the floppy drive cradle. We'll get to work on that in a second. And here is the drive. Now, usually they are not coated in this much dust. Often the Macs that have fans create dust, but it is possible this floppy came from a Mac SE, like Jerry had, uh, and it had a fan in it. Either way, I'm gonna get my reliable air duster and give this thing a squirt, a blow, a <clears throat> get the air off it. this. Oh, it's some kind of Lego Commodore 64 article. Yeah, looks, that looks pretty cool actually. I'll probably vote for that at lego.com. All right, and here's the drive. So to refurbish one of these, firstly, we're going to remove this black clip that keeps the drive head up away from the disc. And then you detach just these two springs here. And they are actually all that's keeping this top piece of the mechanism in place. Now the top piece is easier to remove when the disc is in the ejected position. So I'm going to put a disc in there, eject it, and now you can see it pops right off. Next we get our rubbing alcohol and I'm going to clean all the areas that had dried grease on them. It's basically all the moving parts where things slide and metal grates against metal. And some contact cleaner on these two sensors here. I think that's the right protect sensor and the high density sensor or the disc insertion sensor. Then we'll get some lithium grease. Come on, come out. And re-grease every area where things move against metal. You can remove these four washers, but there is a chance of damaging them and I don't know where you'd get replacements. And I think it's substantial, they just grease through the holes. And you can see a lot of dried up grease here. 30 years of Jerry saving many, many jokes to many floppy disks. We'll just re-grease those again. Next up, I'm going to clean the read right head. Just use a cotton bud and a bit of neat alcohol. Neat. And then you can drop the top piece back on and don't forget to reattach those two springs. And of course the head support. We all need a bit of head support from time to time. That seems to be ejecting much smoother now. And while we're here, we can also clean the screwdriver shaft. This little screw turns and actually moves the head back and forth across the disc. So we just clean all the grime out of all those slots. It's just a lot of old grease and dust. Then you can turn it round manually using some needle nose pliers and do the other half.
And when you're done, get some of that nice new white lithium grease. So now on to the actual eject motor, which was causing that terrible noise. It's pretty simple, just two screws. And pop out the cable. Nice. So if we release this catch here, we can just pry off the top and yep, immediately we can see what's wrong here. This gear has broken and the pieces have got worked into the mechanism. Oh dear. Get a grip, man. So just remove that one gear there. And yeah, you can see here what's happened. So probably the motor was just freewheeling. As I'm demonstrating here. So next up, we have to remove all the little bits of teeth from the rest of the gears. Yeah, it's like pulling teeth, this. And when everything's clean, we can re-grease the gears. Yeah, it's like greasing teeth, this. Wait, that doesn't... <laughs> And through the magic of 3D printing, here is a new gear. So I'm just gonna grease up where it goes, drop it in place. And it's very important to line up this rightmost gear at the three o'clock position, as shown here. That's 1500 hours. That will allow the eject mechanism to connect with the top mechanism and move it back and forth. You can see here where it attaches into that hole and it will basically slide this plate out like that, thus ejecting the disc. Screw it back into place. Don't forget the plug. And I'm gonna put it in this cradle just to protect the moving parts and the electronics while I test things. Back at the Mac, oh, that, that's one of their adverts, wasn't it? Uh, you can put the logic board back into place and the bottom shield, and let's make sure everything's still working. Lovely, and let's try it and see if we've fixed our eject mechanism, fingers crossed. Beautiful. Great success. But we'll have to just call this a partial victory. The discs wouldn't actually be read by the machine. I tried three different system discs and three different drives. I had some spares. All of them just showed this question mark. But I confirmed that the screw drive shaft wasn't stuck and that the drive would spin. Then the machine stopped being able to actually eject and we just, you'd hear this buzzing as the eject motor tried to function. Wait, does that say R2-D2? But we know the eject motor works. And I think this is down to one of these capacitors. They look fine, but over the 30 years, they change electrically. And I think they've stopped being able to power the drive enough to read or in some cases eject. So we're gonna to have to save that for a future episode and we'll recap the board and maybe the logic board too. If worse comes to worse, we can just design and order a completely new Macintosh logic board from PCBWay. They have a deal now where you can get a PCB assembly for $30 and free shipping. Because as we all know, PCB stands for Probable Capacitor Burnout. Doesn't it? Well, either way, I'm going to leave the 80s sitcoms and computers behind and just ask you, do you agree with the hypothesis that it's probably the capacitors causing the discs not to be read? Either way, please like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Comment below and cheerio. Oh, <laughs>